All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Vancouver Aquarium. My name's Colin, I'm one of the teachers on staff here at the Aquarium, and thank you for joining us for Careers in Marine Science today. We're really excited. We've never actually tried anything like this before with anyone who is school age, so we're really happy that you get to be some of the very first people in here. Uh, we're just gonna go over a few notes for what the day may look like. We're gonna spend the next two or so hours together. After that, it's really gonna be up to you for the rest of the day if you wanna explore the aquarium or if you need to head back off for other appointments. We'll see what happens. Uh, you may notice there are some empty seats around you in here. If you wanna squash up next to your neighbors, that wouldn't be a bad idea. We are expecting a full house, but obviously some people may be running a little bit late. So you may be hearing some people filter in as we go through the whole program. Just make sure you're courteous and you make space for people as they come in and then that should be just fine. Uh, has anyone here ever thought about working as a marine biologist, anything like that in the past? One or two people, all right. And one of our staff scientists, that's usually important if they think about that kind of thing. Funnily enough, marine biologist seems to be the only kind of career that we hear people talking about when they hear working with oceans. They think, well, marine biologist, that's kind of the sum and total of it. And there will be marine biologists here that are talking to you today. But something that happened to me in high school was kind of why we wanted to do this right now. I informed one of my high school counselors when I was about grade 10 or 11 that I wanted to be a marine biologist when I grew up. And I very distinctly remember him telling me that, no, there's no money in that job, nobody's ever gonna get hire you in that particular field, don't bother. Somehow later on in my life, I am teaching full time at an aquarium. I'm not really sure how it happened, but there's lots of ways to come to the same kind of place and we're hoping to give you a little taste as to how and you may work with oceans in the future. Uh, just the quick shape of the day up on the screen here. We have seven speakers lined up for you here today. They come from all different fields. It's very exciting to get this many experts in the same room at once. Uh, each speaker is only gonna talk for about 10 minutes or so. Uh, they're really excited to tell you all about what they do, what they love about their job, and how they actually got to be where they are today. Because of that, there may or may not be time for questions at the end of that 10 minutes. We're gonna see what happens. If you don't get the chance for the questions right after the speaker finishes, don't worry about that. The last 30 minutes of the program, all the speakers are gonna come back out. We're gonna spread out through the theater and through the back hall here as well. And you'll get that half hour to approach and talk whoever you feel like talking to. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of different fields. So once you hear all the talks, see who you're most interested in following up with. And you can go and ask those questions and make sure you get a chance to see what's really going on behind there. Uh, just on a logistical note, because I know it's really early in the morning and rushing and lots of coffee tends to make things really complicated. Here's where the bathrooms are. We're just gonna talk about that really fast. We're in the 4D theater right over here. You may have noticed some people came through doors in the very back. There's also a door on the far side here as well. If you just head out to the end of the gallery, there is, is a set of washrooms, or just around the corner, there's a set of accessible washrooms if anyone has any particular mobility needs that they need to suit today. Um, just to get back in, there will be some volunteers. They're dressed in blue with the Vancouver Aquarium logo at all the doors. They're gonna be here to let you back in in case the doors lock behind you. So don't bother pounding on the door. Just walk to the next door to, until you see a staff member and they will let you in. However, I realize I'm really boring. You didn't come here to see me. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our very first speaker here today. Um, I'm not gonna say too much, but if I could give you a very warm welcome to Chad Nordstrom, one of our researchers on staff. Thanks, Colin, and thanks everyone for coming in this morning. Um, the title says researcher, but that's kind of fairly broad here. Almost everyone on this panel is a biologist or a researcher in some capacity. And so I like to think of myself as a wildlife biologist who just happens to specialize in marine mammals. And in particular with the foraging ecology of marine mammals. So if you've got any questions about what that is or what we're doing, um, by all means find me after the break. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, more of the path that I took to get here and along with that, then hopefully you'll get to hear about some of the things that I've done in my career and some of the things I'm doing currently here at the aquarium. So I'm originally from Edmonton, Alberta. I did my undergraduate at the University of Alberta. And I always thought I'd sort of, my goal was to work with large mammals, but I wasn't necessarily thinking marine mammals. I was thinking, well, you know, deer and bear and just that kind of thing, sort of si similar to the, the creatures I was sort of familiar with growing up. And that top slide there with me in the helicopter was uh, one of my summer jobs working with the Canadian Wildlife Service and that was, uh, surveying for elk in southern Alberta uh, in some of the ranges. So that was a, a really great and a fantastic experience. And it sort of started everything off. It was that one first summer job that kind of led to the, the career that I'm in now. And that all started, with, at, again, at the University of Alberta. And I'd asked one of my teaching assistants 
uh, in one of the classes if she knew anyone who needed uh, any volunteers or any help with any of the projects that they were working on. Because that, that, up to that point, I'd been sort of studying biology and I liked learning about it in the classroom, but I didn't know if I was going to like it as a career. I thought it'd be a really good idea to get some experience and see what it was all about before I sort of committed to it long term. And she said, well, what are you interested in? I said, well, I'm into big mammals, but at this point, you know, I'll take anything. Most of the department was interested in fish or plants or, you know, trees, you know, botany, that kind of stuff. And she said, well, ironically, one of my friends has got a project where she's looking at uh, ring seals in the Arctic. And I said, well, that sounds fantastic. And she said, well, how squeamish are you? And that's another thing. A lot of these pictures are really pretty, but a lot of biology is pretty gross. And so she said, well, I'm, I'm OK. I, I can manage things. And she said, well, that's great, because she's looking at um, what they're eating. And it's a, whole, it's a freezer full, hundreds and hundreds of ring seal stomachs that have come from hunters up north. And so that was my very first summer job. No pictures of it, but we spent months and months in a basement without any natural light going through pretty gnarly, sometimes disgusting and smelly ring seal stomachs to find out what kind of fish they were eating. And from that, then they kind of you know, snowballed into a sort of a regular gig with the Wildlife Service, and eventually I was on contract with them for two years after I finished. And that's this picture down here on the right of me and the polar bear. One of the things that that group was interested in was the population biology of polar bears. So how many polar bears are there in certain parts of the Arctic? And in this time, we're uh, in northern Manitoba, so in and around Churchill, pretty much the polar bear capital of the world. It's not, uh, the bear is not dead, it's just anesthetized. And so we were putting on uh, ear tags, instrument um, you know, tags to follow them across the Arctic, that kind of stuff. And that was sort of really cemented what I wanted to do long term in biology. It was sort of, you know, and that's what I became passionate about was where do animals go and what do they do when they're there? And most of the time that has to do with them trying to find food. And at the end of that two years, I was again looking for a job and I ended up uh, getting in touch with the Marine Mammal Research Unit that's based here out of the University of British Columbia. And they're a group that's um, been here for a long time and they have a long-term association with the aquarium. And so even though I was hired on by them, the first thing I did was head out to sea and um, go to sea lion rookeries and collect scat. Does anyone know what scat is? Yeah. Poop. It's poop. I said it's a lot of biology is gross. Some of it's pretty smelly. That's what they did. So they sent me on a ship to southeast Alaska armed with a bunch of Ziploc baggies and a spoon. And they kick you out and you go scrambling around sea lion rookeries picking up poop. Not the most glamorous thing in the world, but again, it gives you a really good idea of what these animals are eating. Uh, so some of those, so I spent a little bit of time in the field with the Marine Mammal Unit, thanks to my experience with the Wildlife Service, but a lot of it was spent here on site at the aquarium with the Marine Mammal Energetics and Nutrition Lab. Right. And that's our team up there in the top left at the time. It was a fantastic group of people to work with, lots of small team stuff, and it's a really neat marriage between the university and the aquarium here. It's a long-term program that's been going on for about 20 years with the central purpose of trying to answer some of the questions on why the stellar sea lions in Alaska have declined so precipi precipitously. So anywhere from about 75 to 80 percent of all of the animals in uh, Alaska, particularly the western population, just disappeared from in about the mid-1970s. And one of the questions surrounding that was, well, was it food? And the only way to get at some of those questions is to look at the nutrition and, and the uh, energetics of animals in the lab. And so the lab here is at the aquarium. Some of the questions that we're trying to answer is, you know, uh, how much energy does it take for a, to, just to be a stellar sea lion? Does it take to sort of you know, live in those harsh environments? How much energy does it take to grow? That picture on the bottom left there, it looks like a sea lion's been decapitated in a guillotine. We're, you know, we're just uh, measuring that animal. So twice a week, they're trained to sort of go into that head guard, and we're taking measurements of their girth and of their length. Uh, there's a lot of specialized equipment to measure their metabolic rates. Uh, it's a pretty fantastic program. And I was there for seven years. And while I was there, I was able to sort of you know, indulge in some of my side projects. And that one here on the bottom right-hand side is me holding a harbor seal pup that was involved in a feeding experiment that was done down with the Marine Mammal Rescue Program that the aquarium's also been involved in. So all told, I was with the group for seven years. And it was a really tough decision to leave. But I felt that I needed to do it to you know, get on to the next stage of my career, which was to get into a little bit more of the analytical side of things. And so in, from that perspective, I'd gotten a lot of experience doing data collection, and I, was, I really enjoyed that part of it. And I'm glad that I had done it because it made me a much better scientist. But I wanted to sort of take it to the next step, and that was doing some of the analysis. And to do that, I needed to go back to grad school. And to do that, and I did that here at UBC. And specifically, I worked on a project in the Bering Sea, um, part of Alaska again. 
and this time focusing on the energetics of northern fur seals and you know basically following my passion where do these animals go and why and to do that, we were tagging a lot of animals. So that uh, top left-hand panel, I realize if you've never seen a northern fur seal before, it's a little bit funny. The little black blob is a pup nursing from mum. And you can follow, sort of follow up the tags that are on her are on her back. But she's sort of arched and looking back towards the camera. So the top of the frame is her chin. <laughs> and then underneath is her nose. So she's upside down looking back at you. Yeah, there you go. Uh, the big male underneath is something you want to avoid when you're on the rookeries. <laughs> And we got to spend a couple of months every summer up there tagging animals, um, spending a lot of time in the field. Absolutely wonderful experience. And it was the kind of thing that gave me a lot of time to work on um, analytical skills and then you know, finally graduated. And it was that set of skills that the uh, Vancouver Aquarium, and particularly my current supervisor, Lance, was interested in when I joined the aquarium again. And so now I'm part of the cetacean research program here at the aquarium. And uh, we, among other things, we study the population biology and uh, the foraging ecology of killer whales. And like I said, so much fun to spend all that time in the field, you know, the wind blowing through your hair, all the rest, but that's really not what we do all that often. Most of the time as a researcher as a, or as a research biologist, you're spent in the lab, you know, on the computers, working up samples. So here we am, writing computer code, you know, we would think, I'm, I never thought I'd be a programmer, but that's a big part of my job now, is to sort of sit and, and write code. Math is an unbelievably important part of my job that I never would have imagined. I've sort of thought in high school and an undergrad in biology is all I'm going to worry about. But if you want to actually do the research, these are the kind of skills that you guys need to have. Uh, partially so if you want to look at uh, you know, mapping the, the temperature in the Bering Sea is sort of the upper left-hand plot. You need to be able to have the skills to do that. So the bottom left there is um, quantifying noise in our environment if you want to know how it might potentially impact marine mammals or cetaceans in particular. And to turn sort of kind of the information that you can collect when you're out there doing your data collection into conservation actions for, for programs like our uh, humpbacks or as I was saying, the, the killer whales. So uh, it was a long winding path. No path is the same. Uh, but to, to becoming a researcher or as a biologist or anyone in this particular field, as Colin said, it's a, it's a wonderful journey. Uh, I don't think it's done for me just yet. Uh, but I'm looking forward to any kind of questions you guys might have afterwards. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much for that, Chad. That was fantastic to hear about how you came to do what you do. Uh, the next person we have coming up is one of our home staff here at the Vancouver Aquarium. Ruby Banwait is an aquarist, which is a strange title for some people, but basically she's one of our aquarium biologists. She's someone who's directly responsible for the care of a wide variety of animals here. But beyond that, can everyone just give a warm welcome to Ruby? Hi, everybody. Um, my, uh, my career here at the Vancouver Aquarium, actually my career in science actually started in about 2002. Um, I was going to school at the time and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was working my tail off and spending all kinds of money on school and I didn't know exactly what for, so I was really quite frustrated. Um, so I decided what I would do is actually take up volunteering in something that I decided that I kind of liked. So for me, I don't really want to work a day in my life because <laughs> nobody really wants to work a whole bunch. Um, so I was trying to think about what I really love to do, what things did I really enjoy, what things was I most passionate about, and how could I make that into my career? So I started thinking about what all the things, what all those things were in my life from the time that I was a little kid until you know the present at the time, and I realized that everything turned back to the ocean. All my favorite holidays all my favorite TV shows, watching Jacques Cousteau with my dad, um, things like that. So I decided like, oh, okay, cool. Well, there's a really great resource here in Vancouver. It's called the Vancouver Aquarium. <laughs> and they have lots of sea, uh, a wide variety of jobs that have to do with the marine world. Uh, so I thought, okay, that's a good place to start. I'm gonna try out volunteering. Um, I started out as a volunteer doing education programs and summer camps with kids, which was like super fun. And along the way in, doing those education programs, I started learning a lot myself and really realized how much I actually enjoyed learning about biology. So at that point I realized, hey, why did it take me so long to figure out what I want to do? So I decided to go back to school and uh, go into a career path of marine biology. Um, I, after s volunteering uh, with kind of the education programs and day camps and things like that for a long time, um, there. I also started doing the Marine Mammal Rescue and Rehab, volunteering at that uh, establishment there, which is off-site from here, but it's still part of the Vancouver Aquarium. 
And I realized, oh my gosh, animals is where it's at. I totally love working with animals. That was the, one of the most amazing things for me. And then an opportunity came up in the department that I'm working for now, which is the BC Waters Department. I'm gonna say it's the coolest, most fun job here at the aquarium. Um, <laughs> I say that because I get to work with, uh, in the field here, which is not something that a lot of people get to do. Um, I get to actually go on collecting trips. They send me to some of the most beautiful places in BC to go collecting, which is super fun. And I get to scuba dive for my job. How awesome is that? Uh, so that's kind of how my career path ended me here actually, and um, over the summer, uh, from, from working with the BC Waters Department as an aquarist, um, so I'm working with things that are fish and invertebrates, and I don't get to ride the marine mammals. Every time I tell somebody that I work at the Vancouver Aquarium, they always want to know, like, oh my god, do you get to ride the dolphins? Like, no, I work with the cool animals, the small stuff, <laughs> the more inconspicuous things, um, which I think is really, really fun. And uh, like I said, I get to look after any of the things that you see in the Treasures of the BC Coast Hallway. That also includes the jellyfish exhibits and the uh, fish and invert exhibits in the Arctic Gallery. So it's a wide variety of animals, and it's, it's so much fun. Um, one of my favorite parts is actually getting to recreate what an environment naturally looks like in an, an artificial setting. And I think that's one of the things that we do really well here is we really provide these animals with exactly, well, not exactly, but as close to as we can what they're going to have in the wild. So that's really fun. And the only way to really be able to do that is actually being in that environment. So getting to scuba dive and getting to go see these places firsthand. So my experiences here with the BC Waters Department led me to an amazing opportunity this last year um, in Petty Harbor, Newfoundland, <laughs> of all places. I, uh, I was given the opportunity to work as the curator for a new mini aquarium that we opened up there. So I actually had a hand in starting a facility from the bottom up, which was an insane <laughs> amount of work. I had no idea really what I was getting into other than I felt very, very green for the position, but it was somebody that empowered me to be like, you know what, I think you have the right tools that you need to be able to do this on a small scale. And we totally made it work. We had an amazingly successful season, uh, first season. And we opened up the Petty Harbor Mini Aquarium in Petty Harbor, Newfoundland, which is just outside of St. John's. So it's literally like as far away from Vancouver in Canada as you can pretty much get. <laughs> it takes forever to get there. But um, it was a really great opportunity because I, had to, I got to work with the equivalent of animals on the East Coast that we have here on the West Coast. So it was really, really interesting, very fascinating, and completely different diving. And not as bad as a lot of people think, oh, East Coast diving, not as good as here. You know what? It was amazing. It was beautiful. You can do bad dives pretty much anywhere. Um, <laughs> so that was one thing that uh, was a real career booster for me. Getting to have Curator on my resume at this stage in the game for me. I've been an aquarist here for about six years is pretty pretty awesome. It's a huge, uh, a huge boost for my career and a, a huge opportunity that I was given because somebody really empowered me, quite a few people actually. It was a whole team effort, I think. Uh, so that's kind of where I got to where I am now. And uh, the Petty Harbor Mini Aquarium is only a seasonal facility, so we closed because nobody <laughs> wants to hang out in Newfoundland in like minus 20 and go to the aquarium. Um, there's not a lot of traffic through the, through the facility at, at this time of the year, so we're opening on World Oceans Day again. Uh, I won't be actually returning to that uh, career uh, in Newfoundland uh, because I, my life is here. I love it here. I really love my job here. <laughs> but uh, um, we're opening on World Oceans Day, which is June 8th of this year, and I'm now on the board of directors, so it's really nice to be able to still uh, be associated with this facility. I put my 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 heart and soul into that place, so I, it would be something too difficult for me to leave. Um, but I'm quite happy to be returning to my job here, and I was actually a little worried about that, to be honest, <laughs> to be going for this position where I had so much opportunity and so much creative license, and I really, no decision could be made there without me. I was a little bit worried, like, how is that gonna translate coming to back to my same job? But the cool thing is, is that my job is never the same. I have new responsibilities, new exhibits. There's always something different happening. And when you're working with animals, no day is ever exactly the same. So that's one thing that I really, really appreciate and enjoy about my job. Um, it's, it's really, really fun. And I get to scuba dive in my exhibits, which is super awesome. You're guaranteed a good dive every time you're going into an exhibit here at the Vancouver Aquarium. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's, that's where I've, uh, I've gotten to. And I look forward to your questions a little bit later. Thanks.
Thank you very much for that, Ruby. We really appreciate your time coming out to talk to us today. Uh, we're going to take a little bit of a separation from the biology tech that we've been doing for the past little while. Uh, we have a guest speaker that's joined us all the way from Vancouver Island. She made a very early journey to get here today. Uh, I have the very great pleasure of introducing someone who I've got to spend some time with over the past year. This is Maya Hoberex. She's joining us from Ocean Networks Canada over at the University of Victoria. So please give a warm welcome to Maya. Hi everyone, I'm really happy to be here. So as Colin said, I'm going to tell you something a little bit different about ocean science that might be something that you don't expect to hear. You can see there's a map on the uh, screen up there, and that's a map of the Ocean Networks Canada installations. We operate cabled observatories, and that big uh, white loop you're looking at there, that's actually a cable that's laid on the seafloor of the Pacific. It's about 800 kilometers long, and it's called the Neptune Observatory. And what it does is it carries power and communications to instruments that are installed on the seafloor. So down there, we have all kinds of different instruments. Basically, if you can plug it in, then we can put it down there. So we have temperature sensors. We have video cameras that stream uh, live video. We have hydrophones so you can hear what's going on. We have seismometers so you can see if there's any kind of earthquake happening out there. And all of that data is um, coming along that cable. And then it goes, it reaches a shore station at Port Alberni. And then it's transferred to the University of Victoria. And then it's streamed to the internet. So when you leave here today, you can actually go to our website and you can see live data coming in from the seafloor. So basically what we did is we took the internet and we put it underwater. Um, now I think that's super cool because you're going to be surprised to know that my background isn't in marine biology like everybody else here, it's in computer science. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the high tech is changing ocean research today and also a bit about um, the strange career path I came um, I, I took to come to ocean science finally. Um, so the, the, that big loop is called Neptune, but also it's a little hard to see on the screen, but um, very close to where we are, there's also another cable out there and that's called the Venus Observatory. And so we also monitor the Strait of Georgia. And that's why it's really exciting for me to be here at Vancouver Aquarium. We work a lot with the people at the aquarium because we have similar interests in finding out the health of our oceans right around the Vancouver and Vancouver Island area. So, um, what do I do in my job? What does it look like to work here? It's, I don't spend my time either riding on the dolphins or anything like that. Um, you might be pretty surprised to know we're a big, huge ocean research facility, but most of the people that work for us are actually computer and IT people or engineers. It's kind of amazing. The um, picture that's at the bottom left there, in that picture, we're taking an instrument platform out of the water that's been down there for a long time. So that's a, a platform that our engineers built that has all kinds of scientific instruments on it, and then it, it plugs into the main network to get that data from those instruments back to the shore. And you can see it looks kind of furry, and that's just because when you put anything down there in our highly productive ocean, it, it gets covered in sea life. So what we do when we're at sea is we bring up these instruments, we bring them on the ship, we clean them all off, we fix everything that's wrong with them, and then we put them back down again. And how we do that is we take a remotely operated vehicle, or ROV, out, which is a submarine that doesn't have any people in it. And we sit on the ship, the submarine has um, high definition cameras on it, so the submarine is operated, it's like a big video game. We've got three people that sit and operate the sub. One person operates each of its arms, it's got manipulators, and one person actually flies the sub around. And we watch the big HD monitors to see what's going on. And so the sub goes down there and picks up our instrument platforms and um, moves them around or plugs them in, whatever needs to be done. So that's pretty cool. So for my job, I do spend time going to sea. But it's not like what Chad does. I'm not documenting whales. I'm actually sitting in this dark control room and saying, OK, now we're going to head to this instrument platform. Could you move the sub over there? Unplug the hydrophone, plug it back in. So it's pretty cool. It's really, really high tech. And I, I, um, I'm a technology fan. I love this kind of stuff. And so when I first got on the ship and I realized you know, that I was seeing computer systems that I'd never seen before, and um, hard drives to record hours and hours and hours of deep sea video. I was so excited. It was just fantastic. Uh, so my job um, 
when I'm not at sea is I've, I've got a title which is Associate Director User Services. What that means is I try to serve our users. So who are the users? The users are you, there are scientists, there are teachers, there are students. So we gather all this data and then we put it out there for people. It's all freely accessible and we promote um, people around the world making new discoveries with our data and doing research. And we've had some really exciting stories. One of our favorites is there was a boy in the Ukraine. He was 14 years old and he just happened to be looking around the internet for cool things related to marine biology and he found some of our deep sea video and he actually witnessed an elephant seal at about a um, thousand meters depth eating a hagfish. So a hagfish is a very slimy kind of thing to eat. And so this was really, really cool because nobody had ever seen one of these elephant seals eating at that depth. And we knew that they could dive that deep because of um, putting tracking devices on them and then you can actually get a record of where the animal has gone. But to actually be able to see that on video and see how these animals are behaving way in the deep ocean where it's in complete darkness, that was something really new and cool. So that's the kind of thing that we're super excited about that um, now anybody, whether it's a scientist or it's um, you know a kid or it's your grandma, like anybody can go on our website and make new discoveries about the ocean. Okay, so that's what we do. So now the question you're wondering is, how does a computer scientist from Ontario, that's me, come to work in Victoria and go out on ships in ocean science? So I have a, like some other people here, a bit of a funny career path. It's not at all what you expect. Um, so I actually um, started university not even in science. I wanted to be a pianist. So I started as a piano major, believe it or not. And um, at that time, I was a, a real perfectionist. And I discovered after um, a year of doing that that I probably wasn't going to be able to have a career in performance. It was just too difficult for me to get up there and, uh, you know, play my pieces in front of people. So meanwhile, I had a job working at a computer company on the side. So I was making money doing this supposedly to fund my piano career. But I thought, you know, I really like this computer science stuff. And I'd taken as one of my options a computer science course. So um, yeah, so I thought, OK, maybe I'll take more of that. <clears throat> then the other thing that I was really interested in at the time was philosophy. And I had this idea that you know philosophy asks a lot of big questions, like, what is a good life? Uh, what should we be doing? Um, what is right and wrong in life? And those big, huge questions really attracted me. I thought, yes, these are the things I want to think about. So I ended up doing my undergraduate degree in computer science and philosophy. And what I was thinking at the time that I wanted to do, I was thinking, well, I want to somehow see how we can use science and technology to make the world a better place. That was my thinking. And um, I had some vague ideas of what I wanted to do as a career. I was thinking something like, could I be a science policy advisor, or maybe I'll be a science writer, something like that. And then um, when I finished my undergrad degree, I went to California, and I worked on a really exciting project. So I did a summer internship, and I worked on a project at the Xerox Research Institute where we were building a modular robot. So we built a robot out of um, little tiny parts um, called actuators. They were actually just sort of like hinges like this. And what was really cool about this robot is it could reconfigure itself um, according to its environment. So you could send this robot out in the field and then it could say, okay, I've got a really narrow space to go through, so I should change my shape into something more snake-like so I can make it through there. This was just such a cool experience for me, and I really realized, you know, what I love is high tech. I love it. I think it, it opens up so many possibilities of what, I can, what we can do um, in the world and um, how we're able to build new things. So I ended up going to grad school, and um, I made a choice that I'm really, really happy with. I could have chosen philosophy or computer science at the time because that was my background. And I thought, I better go for the tech degree. So I did my graduate school in computer science. And I did that at Western University. It was, it was great. Um, but the thing is, I, I still had an interest in so many different things. So I was still pursuing the music aspect. And my whole life, I've been a lover of the ocean. So when I finished my degree and I was looking around for really cool jobs, I saw this one at Ocean Networks Canada and I thought, well, this is perfect for me, the person that wants to bring high tech to somewhere that we can really make a dif difference in the world. And, and I applied and I was lucky enough to get it. 
So that's kind of my very strange um, route to coming to this. But I, I want to um, try to share with you why I think this is such a great um, path to take. And I hope that maybe some of you will consider a career in technology so that you can combine this with your love of ocean science and marine biology, which is probably what brought you here to the aquarium. So first of all, notice that we're living in a high-tech world. You have a computer in your pocket if you've got a cell phone, there's a computer in your car, and now you know there are computers in the ocean. This is not going to change. It's just going to become more and more and more like this. So as we go forward, computers and computer technology and internet technology is going to become more and more ubiquitous. In other words, it'll be everywhere. So this is a great thing to know something about. To have the most exciting um, and cutting edge careers in our future, you probably will need to know something about computer science and engineering. And um, for me, what you've probably figured out is I am curious about all different kinds of things. I'm not a specialist in just one field. I like knowing a little bit about a lot of different things and bringing them together. And that's why also ocean science is such a great field for me, because nobody discovers anything alone in ocean science. You probably know about this. For example, think about how the ocean has such a big effect on the weather. You've heard a lot about hurricanes and typhoons, for example. To understand what's going on there, you need the expertise of an atmospheric scientist and a computer scientist and an oceanographer to try and build a model to find out, you know, where is this hurricane going to hit? It's not just one person. Um, another example of that is tsunamis. So we've, we've heard a lot about the Japanese tsunami, but you um, probably know we are also here in an earthquake zone. So to find out where a tsunami is going to hit, you can't just ask one type of scientist. You need a geophysicist who's going to be able to tell you something about earthquakes. You need a physical oceanographer who can tell you, well, this is the wave that will be generated. And then you need a computer scientist to run a model who can say, this is where that wave is going to affect people on land. So all of these things that um, we're trying to discover about the ocean need expertise from different fields. And I love that because in my job, I work with people um, of all different backgrounds and I learn so much about um, the ocean and about the science from my colleagues. And that's really, really exciting for me. So um, when you're considering what you wanna do, from my own experience, I can advise you that you'll never go wrong having a, um, a technology uh, minor or a technology major in your back pocket. Um, I have not done any volunteer work because I always got paid for all my jobs, which was really, really helpful in putting me through school. And um, the other thing that I just want to emphasize is, you know, a lot of people said to me, oh, you know, when are you going to focus on one thing and um, what are you going to be doing with your career? But the thing is, doing all these different things and learning many different things is actually what brought me to the point that I'm at. And so there is a place for people who are curious about all different aspects of science. And I hope in the future we'll see a lot more of this interdisciplinary research where people from different fields talk to each other and make great discoveries. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much for that, Maya. That's definitely a bit of a different take than most people go to get into the ocean. So thank you for sharing that perspective with us today. Uh, the next speaker we have up is Jenna Peterson. She's one of those people that works here at the aquarium that has probably one of the most popular jobs on earth, at least from the kinds of people that I tend to hang out with. Jenna is part of our marine mammal training team. Can everyone give a warm round of applause to Jenna? Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Jenna, and I am an assistant marine mammal trainer. So um, I've been here at the Vancouver Aquarium for just under a year now. And being a trainer is actually something that I've always wanted to do my whole life. Uh, when I turned six years old, my parents took me to uh, SeaWorld in Orlando. And we had a meeting much like all of you are doing now with a trainer. And this trainer told me uh, basically everything that I'm going to tell you now. So in order uh, to be a marine mammal trainer, there are uh, kind of a lot of steps, but I've sort, uh, sort of narrowed them down into four steps. So uh, the first thing that a marine mammal trainer should have is a university or a college degree. So um, I went to school in, in Ontario and I have a degree in psychology. Uh, could be marine biology, zoology, or even a general science degree. 
Uh, the second step is to be comfortable around water. So in order to uh, be a marine mammal trainer, most facilities require swim tests and most facilities also require uh, scuba certifications, which is pretty fun. Uh, and the last step is to gain uh, animal experience. So this is probably one of the most important um, steps. So you can start now, even uh, when I was younger, I asked for more responsibility at home with my dog. I volunteered at a dog training facility, uh, even volunteering at a ranch working with horses. Uh, probably the most important thing is to gain experience at an aquarium. So after I graduated university, I left Ontario and moved to beautiful Florida, and I was in Florida for about a year, and I did two marine mammal training internships uh, in Florida, working with dolphins and sea lions. And then after that, I came right here to the Vancouver Aquarium, um, and I volunteered for four months um, as a marine mammal intern when I got such amazing experiences working with the trainers, uh, preparing food, learning all the basics of training, um, and just having a lot of fun uh, for those four months. And then I was super, super fortunate uh, to be hired on right after that. So what do I do? Uh, so basically, every morning uh, for a trainer starts in the fish house. So sorting through fish, um, preparing animal diets, um, from there, we go into training sessions. So we run about four training sessions an hour, give or take. Uh, it's, it's always different every day. Um, during the training sessions, uh, we work on husbandry behaviors, or basically healthcare behaviors with the animals. Uh, we train new behaviors for mental stimulation. And we also work on um, high energy behaviors, like leaps and breaches for physical exercise. Uh, we also do animal encounter programs. Uh, we work a lot with the public. We do research studies. And we also do a lot of play sessions with the animals, too. So that part of the job uh, is, seems pretty glamorous. But uh, in reality, a trainer's day can be half interacting with the animals and then half uh, interacting with, um, or sorry, half other responsibilities. For, so for example, interacting with the public um, record keeping and lots and lots of cleaning. So there's a really, really pretty picture of me up there uh, cleaning the sea otter habitat and covered in a not very glamorous things. Uh, so one of my favorite parts of being a marine mammal trainer are, are the play sessions and the relationships that you develop with the animals. Uh, so it's, we do play sessions um, all day, um, every day, whenever we get a chance with all of the animals. In the play sessions, uh, we can get into the water with them um, and, and interact with them in the water. And we can give them toys, uh, mix up different kinds of toys, and we can even make ice treats. So that top right picture up there uh, is a picture taken last Easter, and it was basically just a uh, chopped up fish in a different color ice cube block. So it's, it's really, really fun um, being creative with our enrichment and our play sessions. Yeah. Um, so the last thing um, that I would tell you about being a marine mammal trainer is if you really, really want to get into this field, then don't give up. It all being everything that has to do with um, oceans and marine mammals, it's, it's really competitive in aquariums. Um, but there's really, really not any other job in the entire world um, that I would rather be doing right now. I have the best job at the aquarium. <laughs> um, and that's all. So I really look forward um, to all of your questions. Thank you again for that, Jenna. I'm pretty sure you do have one of the more exciting jobs on Earth right there. Um, just moving on to the next speaker that we have here, we are going back to a more strictly scientific kind of endeavor here as well, but we're very excited to have one of our local researchers right here. Uh, the Howe Sound Research Group is a group that works in Howe Sound, believe it or not, uh, that local body water that's just right behind us. If you ever take the highway down over towards Whistler, you have driven past Howe Sound. So it is a very important local body of water, and we're very fortunate to have Jessica Schultz from the Howe Sound Research and Conservation Team joining us to tell us about what she does. Give a round of applause for Jessica. Hello, everyone. So as Colin said, I'm with How Sound Research. I'm the research coordinator. coordinator. And yeah, again, so if you've ever driven up to Whistler, how many people have driven up to Whistler in the last winter? Yeah, so a few people. 
So when you go up there and you look on your left, that beautiful body of water, that's how it sound. As you can see in the top right there. Um, that's actually a map of, oops, oh no. <laughs> One moment while we fast Sorry. forward through the technology. It's all good. We're very high tech with our keyboard here, as you can tell. <laughs> Don't put the book on it. <laughs> And let's see Jenna again one more time. <laughs> Perfect. Cool. So there's two main things we do in our job. One of them is taxonomy, and that's the identification, classification, and description of different animals. And you've probably heard the stat that the ocean is about 70% unexplored. And usually when people talk about that, it's like what Maya was saying about the deep sea. There's very, very little known about that. It's very little known about the water column in the middle. All sorts of things live there, and we don't know what's going on. But the other area that's really unexplored is in a lot of the details of the small organisms that live in the ocean. <coughs> Excuse me. So you see in the top left picture, there's a picture of a sea star that's sick. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But all around that sea star, there's all kinds of other things living. The brown blob in the top there is a, is a piece of kelp. And down near the bottom left, there's a piece of red algae. And as soon as I see, say the word algae, I just saw about three people start to nod off. But there's some really cool things about algae. For example, did you know that me and you are more closely related to mushrooms than that red blob is related to that green blob? So when we go and we go to, and do taxonomy, we want to know who's who in the marine zoo and try to figure out what's there and describe it. So in that as aspect, we get to be explorers. And down here in the bottom right, we've got a glass sponge reef. That's one of the cooler things that we're exploring right now. So these are reefs that are made out of glass, hence glass sponge reef. And until about 2004, when we figured that they were in half sound, um, no one knew that they existed this shallow since the Jurassic Age. So in a way, they're kind of like dinosaurs that we get to visit in our backyard. So that's really exciting. Um, the other thing we do other than taxonomy is ecology. And that's how organisms interact with one another and their environment. So there we get to ask questions. We get to try to understand how everything's connected to everything else. And we learn that, in fact, everything is connected. The most, or one of the most famous examples in ecology has to do with sea otters and urchins, which are those spiky dudes in the bottom left corner there. And on the outer coast of British Columbia and farther north, when sea otters were harvested for their pelts or um, poached or whatever the correct term is, um, sea otters eat urchins. So once they were gone, all the ur urchins exploded in population. And urchins eat algae and kelp, which, by the way, kelp aren't always just little blobs. They can grow to be big, tall forests, as tall as this room. And they're really beautiful. And they support all kinds of other life, like fish and crabs um, and even mammals farther down the chain. So that's how things are connected. So there in the bottom left, we're keeping track of how many urchins there are, what they're eating whether there's algae around, and that type of thing. So we get to ask big questions, and that's a lot of fun. So how did I get here? Well, I started off doing what you see in the top left there, which, as you can see from the picture, wasn't any fun at all. That's me working in the Caribbean. I lived and worked on the ship that you can see in the background there, taking people scuba diving and taking, taking them hiking and kayaking. And it was a really fun job. Um, but what it lacked was the same sort of rewarding uh, commitment to, to the bigger picture that a lot of us find here at the aquarium. So like Maya, I actually first went and studied philosophy when I came out of high school. I thought I wanted to be an artist. I hated math. Um, but once you go out into the world and you find some things that are really cool and you really want to do, then you get this extra motivation to do those things that maybe you don't like so much. So once I decided that I wanted to do something that, where I could contribute to society a little bit more than having fun in the Caribbean, which was great, by the way, um, I went back to university, and I had to take calculus. But when there's something that you're working towards, it's not so bad. And I'm just going to say as well from experience that it's OK to change your mind once in a while and go back and figure out what it is that you're passionate about. So I went back to school. And while I was in school, I did what's a lot of what's called technical diving, which is where you're using more equipment and more training so that you can explore deeper and stay down for longer. So in that picture there, I'm using what's called a side mount configuration where you wear your tanks on your side so that you can squeeze into small cracks and shipwrecks and that type of thing. And it's a lot of fun. And that really appealed to my wanting to be an explorer side of things as well. So I went back to school. And after 
some volunteering, but I didn't volunteer with mammals so much, it was more diving, because that's what I love to do. So I was out volunteering, doing research for other researchers, um, getting more dive credentials and that type of thing. So whatever it is you like to do, do a lot of it, and you'll end up in a good place. And after that, I ended up finding a little bit more of the rewarding meaning that I was looking for. For example, the work that we do on ling cod population dynamics, ling cod's a big fish, um, led to an anti-poaching campaign that's out at Point Atkinson and different places in Howe Sound. So that's cool when you get to see that your work's actually having a difference in the decisions people make in their everyday life. You can eat ling cod, but you just don't want to fish them in places where they're depleted, for example. Up in the top right there, I'm doing some researches on sea stars. Oh, no, I forgot to go back to that other one there. But since September, a lot of the sea stars have gotten really sick, and we don't know why. And sea stars are really iconic. You see them on the beach when you're a little kid, and they're one of the most common species that you notice when you dive here in Howe Sound. And so when they all get sick, we want to know why. So and that's, that picture is actually before that, where we're doing a genetic study on sea stars, and we've taken them up to collect some samples. And that's, that research is going to contribute to figuring out what the answer is to why these sea stars are getting sick. Sea stars are cool, by the way. Do you know that they can lose an arm and then grow it back again? That's some pretty cool alien stuff right there. And in fact, sometimes that arm can break off, crawl away, and then grow into another sea star. That's pretty badass. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that, but I said it. <laughs> uh, what do I love my, about my job? Well, like everyone else who's spoken, everything. Um, I get to do what I love to do. I get to be underwater in these beautiful places. I get to be outside, not every day, but very often. And I get to learn about the natural world, ask questions, and hopefully find some answers that'll make a difference. So I'll be happy to answer your questions about my job and how I got here later on. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. Uh, just looking at some of the pictures in here, this is some of the first time I've seen some of these images as well. It just kind of reminds you that we're very, very fortunate in British Columbia that we have so many things that are right here that we don't tend to get to see too often. So just having a chance to get that little window into people who do this every day for a living is really something special, I think. Uh, the next person that we have up is someone who's very special to me. Uh, the next speaker is Teresa Skirianos, who's assistant manager of our interpretive delivery department. Teresa was one of the very first people I worked with here at the aquarium. Back when I was in teacher's college, she was one of my first bosses. I was very fortunate to get to work with her. But she's going to tell you more about what being a science interpreter is all about. Give a round of applause to Teresa. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, equally as honored to have worked with you all these years as well. Um, so as Colin said, I am the assistant manager of the interpretive delivery department here at the Vancouver Aquarium. And when I first say to people that I'm an interpreter, most of the time the question I get is, oh, so what language do you speak? Um, and while some of the interpreters here at the aquarium do speak many languages, we are a different kind of interpreter. We actually speak the language of science. So you might have also heard us being referred to as nature guides, tour guides, or naturalists as well. And so we're primarily focused on public education and programming. So our job is to engage the thousands and thousands of guests that come through the doors here at the Vancouver Aquarium. So we do this by not only highlighting fun facts about the animals and the ecosystems that we showcase here in our galleries, but we also do that through um, really bringing forth the conservation issues that the an animals uh, are facing out there, but also empowering people to know that there's stuff that each and every one of us can do every single day to help make positive change. So where you'd see us is out in the galleries interacting with guests in formal and informal ways. So informal interpretation can come in the form of one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with guests out in the galleries. It can also come through the use of some pretty impressive props. We do have a props master here at the aquarium that actually gets all of our props prepped for us. So. Standing outside of our shark exhibit holding a shark jaw um, can really springboard conversations about these animals and the conservation issues that they face out in the ocean. Or, allowing guests to touch a sea otter pelt. Um, is there anyone here who's ever touched a sea otter pelt before? Okay, a few hands. Was it here at the aquarium? 
Yeah. Um, well, having guests touch the sea otter pelt and then using that to highlight why that fur is so important to the sea otter survival can be really powerful. Um, so we have many, many props at our disposal. But informal interpretation can also come in the form of smaller programming. We call them critter corners, which gives guests the opportunity to potentially touch very gently some of the uh, live invertebrates that we find off the coast of British Columbia. So you can touch sea urchins and sea cucumbers. Even uh, we have up close critter corners with snakes and, and um, cockroaches, fun things like that. Uh, we also have the pleasure of running the behind the scenes tours here at the aquarium, which is definitely one of the most fun things for us as interps to do, because it really shows people the vast amount of work that takes place behind the scenes here that you just don't really get a feel for entirely when you're out in the galleries. But what we are most well known for here at the aquarium is our formal interpretation. And so that comes in the form of our microphoned programs. So we do get on microphone for large scale programs like you see up there, our dolphin show. Uh, and we run these every single day. And so public speaking is part of our job every single day. Um, and it's a lot of fun to be up there and to be the one sharing all this amazing information with the visitors and to be that source for questions afterwards. And I didn't actually know what this kind of interpreter was or even what interpretive delivery was before I was exposed to it here at the aquarium. Um, but it is definitely a rapidly growing field of work. Uh, there are institutions worldwide now that are interested in having interpreters on site to engage the visitors that come through their doors, whether it's in a park or another zoo or aquarium or even museums. And so uh, personally, my story, how I got into interpretation, I have a, probably a pretty similar story to a lot of people that get into marine science. From a very young age, I had a passion for it. Uh, I grew up on the West Coast here in British Columbia. I've lived here my whole life and had the opportunity to be on the water every summer with my family. We would go to Bamfield every single year. Uh, and so I always knew that I wanted a career in marine science. And I always knew I ultimately wanted to end up here at the Vancouver Aquarium. But I really didn't know what path I wanted to take with marine science and really didn't know what paths were even available to me at the time. And so that's why I think a workshop like this is truly incredible to, to sort of get that out there. So when I found out that there was actually a career where I could talk about the animals that I love and the ecosystems that I feel so passionately about, I was certain there was a catch, um, but I was also very inspired and really excited by it. So I get to talk about Pacific white-sided dolphins and the issues that they face, and that's a job. All right, sure, sign me up. <laughs> um, but there is a lot more to it. Um, you know, there's uh, a lot more aspects to the job. We, in our adult life, get to be super creative, which is really exciting. We are the ones responsible for developing all of the programs that end up on the floor for the public programming. And uh, we get to source out all these amazing supporting materials and props to, to support the program. And it's a job where you're constantly learning. Uh, we are the employees that people seek out to answer the questions that they have when they come through our doors. And so it is our responsibility to seek out answers to questions that we don't know. And so we're learning things all of the time. Ultimately, the interpreters here are the voice of the Vancouver Aquarium to the guests that come through our doors. And uh, we get to highlight all of the incredible work that goes on here and share it with our visitors every single day. Uh, so another really amazing part of this job is that we are in constant collaboration with marine researchers and scientists. Um, for example, you heard about the BC Cetacean Sightings Network earlier, and we are able to take that information, put it into a dolphin show, and really empower people to know that the sightings that you report can have a positive impact on animals just like these two dolphins that we have here in this habitat. So we are in constant connection with the researchers that are conducting this groundbreaking research and we always make sure that our programs are as up to date as possible for our visitors. It's definitely a very rewarding career. Um, I have been an interpreter here at the Vancouver Aquarium for six years now. Um, I started off as a volunteer, uh, soon got hired on and haven't left since, and I'm not sure if they'll be able to get rid of me. Um, and now I have the pleasure of co-managing a team of amazing interpreters whose primary goal when they come to work is to inspire and to share their passion with people that come through the doors. So it's truly incredible. Um, if interpretation is something that sounds like it would be interesting to you, there are many things you can do to start building your resume. 
I mentioned earlier public speaking. Any form of public speaking is a positive. We sometimes interpret to audiences of over 400 people in the summertime at, say, a Beluga show. And so having that on your resume is a plus. And some of our interpreters come to us with master's degrees in you know, sustainable resource management and biology, but also some come to us with a mix of other amazing skills, like a background in theater um, and in the arts. And so it is a, a career, I think, that hones many, many skills, and it's one that I absolutely um, love and encourage you to seek out if you're looking for a rewarding career in marine science. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Teresa. Uh, we are just about at the end of our talks here. There is one more speaker left, and this is one that a lot of people also pay quite a lot of attention to as soon as they hear any kind of career that has to do with animals. Uh, Betsy Culp is one of our externs here with our veterinary staff. If you ever considered a career in medicine and you want to think about things that are more exciting than people, this may be the talk you want to pay attention to. Without any further ado, please welcome Betsy Culp. Good morning. All right. So, how many of you guys out there knew what you want know what you want to do right now? What you want to do for the rest of your career? Yep, some of you do. Excellent. That's what I thought too. I really did. Um, I always had a passion for everything that w went on in the ocean. I have a love of every animal out there. And then I decided, well, I graduated from school, went to 6 years of college, got my undergrad degree in biology. Things just weren't right for me to apply for veterinary medicine at that time, so I went into law enforcement. How many of you guys want to be a police officer? No hands. All right. Well, that's what I did for 10 years, and then I decided, guess what? I'm not challenged enough, and my true passion in life just kept calling to me. Every fiber in my body said, veterinary medicine. This is what I'm put on this planet for. So four years ago, I started down that track again and taking a very alternate path than most people do into veterinary medicine. That's what I decided to do. So I am actually in my last portion of my veterinary education right now. I am a senior at finishing right now at University of Tennessee. And this is part of my graduation requirement. I am serving here for four weeks as an extern. And now what that does is you go out outside of your college and you actually get experience that you're not going to actually get from veterinary school. So since this is something I really want to do for the rest of my life, I am here. This has been one of my dreams to actually come to Vancouver Aquarium and actually learn from the veterinarian and the veterinary staff here. So I have been here for three weeks now, and every day is different. You ask me what I love about this job, every day is different. You never know what's going to come in the door, you never know what's going to be sick, and you get to make a difference in these animals' lives. So. That being said, we actually get to prevent disease. That's a major, major thing that we actually do in veterinary medicine, especially in zoo and aquarium work. A lot of it is preventative based. We try and make sure that these animals don't get to the point that they're sick. But when they do get sick, then we are actually looking for treatments. Because this is a newer field, we're actually taking some of the stuff that we learn from dogs and cats, and we're actually applying it across the border, and we're actually learning a lot. The field has gone a lot further in the last 10 years than it, what we knew 10 years ago. So um, every day is different. I get to work with the animals. I get to help educate. We talk and work with our keeper staff, with our aquarists, with students, with the general public. So if you guys ever have any questions on things that you might want to know about in the future, where the trends are going, go ahead and talk to us afterward. So when I say we're making a difference, we actually treat the individual animals. We actually look at populations. Sometimes it's hard to treat one fish in one tank. You might have to treat an entire tank of animals. Um, so we look at populations. We actually do research also. Since everything is so new out there, we're keeping information. We're actually going further than what people have gone before. We're trying the new medications. We're seeing what works. We're keeping records of what's going on longer, and we can actually make prognostic indicators for what we're going to try in the future also. With education, what a lot of people don't realize is that we work also closely with diseases that can impact human populations, animal populations, and then the interface of what goes on 
because sometimes we actually get a lot of diseases that cross over from animals to humans. So if medicine is something you're interested in, you have an inquisitory nature, you like to do investigating, you like science, that might be your uh, realm in life that you want to go ahead and migrate towards. <coughs> Excuse me. So what is really exciting in this field is where we're going in the future. Do you guys have like a real big drive to investigate, get into what's going on out there, what's going on in trends? If that's the case, this might be something you might want, want to look for. Now, as you can see, we have actually an otter that's up at the top. We also have a sea lion down here. Both of these are cases here that were uh, worked with here at the uh, Vancouver Aquarium. So amongst the species that we work with are going to be our fish. We're going to actually work with echinoderms like starfish. We actually have seals. We have our Pacific white-sided dolphins, belugas. So anything from the microscopic sizes all the way up to our macrofauna is going to be something that you can go ahead and study for. You can start looking into things now and just compile that information with you as you go ahead into your university years. So with that, if you guys have any questions about veterinary medicine, how to get into it, what you can do now to actually prepare yourself and put yourself ahead of a crowd of trying to get in because there's only about 2% of the population that goes into medicine and becomes a physician or a veterinarian and it is very competitive. We recommend you start thinking about that now. You don't need to know that's what you want to do now, but it also helps to plan ahead. So thank you for coming out today. Appreciate your interest. If you guys have any questions, I'll be down here afterwards to help answer any questions you have. Thank you very much for that, Betsy. We really appreciate it. Oop, that's a little bit loud. All right, this is where we get to the really exciting part of the day as well. Uh, we're so happy that so many experts have taken the time to come and talk a little bit about what they love about their jobs, how they may have come around to get to this particular career path. Now we know that you may have a few questions. This is a unique opportunity that's only for you folks that are here in the theater right now. For the next close to 40 minutes here, we will have the experts time until almost 11 o'clock. You are welcome to go up and talk to any of the people who have just presented to you over the past hour and a bit, and you'll get to ask them any questions that you may have and talk to them a little bit more, maybe find out some more information that wasn't in the talk itself, and hopefully just get that up-close experience with experts that normally aren't immediately accessible whenever you want them. So do take advantage of this opportunity. It's something that's very, very important. Uh, it's something that's really exciting that we get to do here as well. Uh, what we are going to do, I haven't told my speakers this, so this is more of a housekeeping for them as well. Because I am a teacher by training, I am a micromanaging person with a lot of control issues, as some of you students here may know already. Uh, just around the theater here, there's a few sheets of paper. They have people's names on them in the title. And also around the corner, we will have some of the speakers there as well through this back hallway. So looking over on the top side here, Chad, who is our very first speaker with BC Cetacean Settings, is going to be in this corner here. Going around the hall out the door, you're going to be running into Ruby, who is our aquarium biologist and aquarist. You'll be running into Teresa, who is our interpreter, who is there. And just around the corner from them will be Jenna, who is our marine mammal trainer. Over on the far side in the top corner is where Betsy, our veterinary extern, who was just talking to you, will be. And on the very last side over here, we will have Jessica, who is one of our researchers with House Sound. Again, our time here is finished. Thank you all so much for joining us here in the theater and for our community for joining us online. Enjoy talking to all of our experts that we have. Oh, sorry, we have one last thing that was mentioned here. Just before you take off to talk to the experts, for those people sitting in the theater here, check very quickly underneath your seat. You may see a gold star sticker. So just as you flip over the seat, if you see that sticker, go talk to Maya. She may have a few things for you. So if you have the gold star, congratulations. You've won a door prize here today. Otherwise, thank you all so much, and enjoy the rest of your day here at the Vancouver Aquarium.